Matt Dillahunty says that um, that the Kalam cosmological argument cannot prove that a god exists, which is kind of ridiculous. Which is kind of ridiculous because we could use that to infer, or at least implicitly say, oh, that so God could be that uh, God could be that transcendent timeless spaces uh, life form. However, it does have its limitations because it exists within the realms within the realm of causation. So, like what you said, Smokey, it is. It, it's the. I think it's. I think it's the fact that the cause and effect um, concept exists within the realm of the universe, but kind of not like it's outside of it. I mean, there has to be something contingent other than an uncaused cause. So, yeah, I think I could understand why it would lead into an infinite regress because. In order for you to understand the cause, you gotta have another. You gotta explain the cause of that cause, and then if you want to explain the cause of that cause, you gotta explain right. the cause of that cause well, of that cause. And the way I had the way I had pitched it to them, which they they didn't want to yield to it, and they kept ignoring the point. That's why I said I was pointing out like their contradiction mm -hmm. um, is that I was affirming the potentiality of a non-temporal cause with a temporal effect. So, and I did this with even what Kenny had said, which I thought was very spot on, of the idea, there is no potentiality with God. There is no pondering with God. There is no succession of thoughts with God. He is non-temporal in his mind. Right. There is no time. To him so there is no sequence there's no potentiality there's nothing like what some of the molinists say and many of the people who straw man the molinists say where god looked down the corridors of time and chose which reality to actualize there's none of that there's no potentiality there's just pure act he's pure act there's no potentials or counterfactuals to him he just is and this does kind of filter down into the concept of divine simplicity which i strongly lean to and i think both defends itself well um and explains a lot about our reality and how god relates to it so god has no counterfactuals no nor potentials nor does he have mental processes as we do like before God created everything, he knew what would happen. It was all objectively real to him. And he had feelings, sensations about the things that were happen that we do see him clearly express in scripture. When he says he regretted creating man, or he says he was grieved, or he says he was angered. You know, these are real sensations that he is pushing forward analogously you know he's saying not that we can say that well he's feeling these sensations exactly the way we do but he's painting to them to us so that they are relatable relational when god says he's angry we're not able to relate unequivocally to that to know what god's anger is like we don't we're not able to crawl inside god and see how he sees things to know how angry he is but when he says he's angry, we analogically reference that to ourselves to give it a relational dynamic, you see? Now, God felt that anger before he created anything because he knew it would exist. However, he expressed it temporally. Doesn't mean he experienced it temporally. But it does mean he expressed it temporally, right? See, yeah, I, yeah. I get, I get the essence and the experiential thing that you. I mean, this all go. This all boils back to. So what the you real told me kicker, to. if you really want to get the atheists on this, and these guys were very dishonest and evasive. But the thing you have to do to really get the atheists on this is get them to either affirm or deny temporality beyond the universe. See, mm. once they take a stance on that, they're kind of locked in to one set of argument or another. 
And if they deny temporality beyond the universe, if they affirm it is time is indeed a physical property of our physical universe, if that is indeed the case, then it doesn't necessarily exist beyond the universe. And if you can get them to affirm that, then there's no reason then to draw a reference point to a singularity, a non-temporal, non-temporal uncaused cause, because it would be an uncaused cause if it was non-temporal and eternal. It wouldn't have any regression to it, wouldn't have any genesis to it. In fact, by nature of it being timeless, it's impossible for it to have a genesis. Genesis or origin requires a placement in time space, composition, form given to it. But eternal, timeless, once they go down that road, there's no reason then to affirm a singularity of causation beyond the universe. That which instigated the beginning of the universe and not as a regression is a singularity because a regression re requires some form of temporal temporality requires some form of time space it would require an allowance of a sequence of events but a timeless realm such things are incoherent they're impossible right you know everything that is there is in an eternal state always was always is it doesn't fit with any idea of of time at all you could even say that the decision to create reality was an eternal decision and all of god's sensations and feelings about what's in creation were eternal feelings and sensations there's no sequence to them because mm -hmm. they're timeless and god exists timelessly right right so i guess i i i mean would it would it be relatable to the verse where david preaches that god has existed from everlasting to everlasting would that be a relatable thing of all um, said? yeah see and that's not even that's that's what we would call um, um, basically either, well, I guess it would be a mirrorism. It would be a mirrorism to say from everlasting to everlasting. So it's kind of drawing this picture of perpetual past, perpetual future. And in the idea of the mirrorism, it takes the outer edges of extreme, which you would say the most extreme past and the most extreme of future. And you would be communicating about everything in between. Right. So like when you say an example of a mirrorism would be like if I told you I lost my keys, I searched high and low for them. Well, you're not going to mm -hmm. think I literally searched high of and course. literally searched low and that's all I searched. You're going to take that to mean I searched everywhere. That's an example of a modern mirrorism and an idiom that we use. Is. Now, the Hebrews used a lot of mirrorisms to communicate things. So to say from everlasting to everlasting is to basically make that idiomatic statement eternal. Right. You take the extreme potential ends to basically communicate the entirety or a tautology. Um, another example is in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth mm -hmm. that's a that's painting a picture of a tautology it's painting a painting a picture of the entirety of all of reality all of time space it's a mirrorism so you take the, the lowest area it's recognizable to man it's the earth and you take the highest area that's recognizable to man which is the heavens and you say god created the heavens and the earth well that's not stating he literally just created the heavens and literally just created the earth it's not that mm -hmm. type of literal way that's what the young earthers do it's a mirrorism. It mean it's a statement that God created everything, all existent matter. And right. when he's hovering over the earth, when his spirit is hovering over, well, it's not even the earth yet. It's just the location where the earth would be, because it says the earth was without form and void. That's lack of composition, lack of essence. And then at some point during this verse or immediately after this verse the earth is formed the solar system is formed everything is placed and then god is there on the face of the earth that he has just intimately formed and put together and is now beginning a creation event at the biological level um, and you see when you look at it this way a level of care and intimacy and focus i mean think about it you have God of the universe who, and I'm an old earther, so I'm going to take it from that perspective. God of the universe created all of this splendor, all of this glory, all of these stars, all of these solar systems everywhere. And then he just hyper focuses 
for billions of years on this one tiny little spot in this massive, huge, expansive, expanding creation. He spends billions of years with super pristine hyper focus on this one little dot, intimately here, intimately reacting, intimately creating, intimately enjoying his creation, bringing forth animals of various kinds, bringing forth bacteria, shaping the environment, shaping the atmosphere, just intimately involved in that which would end up being gifted to his prized creation, mankind, who was created with the intention to ultimately be a relational agent that could engage in a free will, truly loving expression with him. And we fucked it all up. Yeah. Wow. So. That's a lot to take in, but you know what? That just... That just made me appreciate God's Such love is the power us. of the gospel, brother. Such is the power of the gospel. Because the idea that God would lower himself to draw so much focus and energy and love and expression on such a pitiful, insignificant, flawed, worthless specimen just shows the outrageous, unending abundance of his grace and love and mercy. Wow.